I would like to thank you so much, uh, Laurie, to accept this kind invitation because I think that we can share a lot out of your fantastic journey. And also, uh, I believe that uh, the modality that you're practicing and all of what you're doing with the Barbara Brennan School is just unbelievable. It's unique in the world. So I'm very, I'm very happy and I'm very... Uh, I feel very privileged to, to have you guys. So thank you for your accepting this invitation. You're welcome. Right. All and right. Thank you for so, the invitation. Yes. Right. Uh, Laurie, um, I would like to start by the, the very beginning of your career. Um, it's a very basic question, however, a very fundamental one. So how did you discover about universal energy and when did you decide to 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 continuously uh, uh, pursue your way and even make it a career how did it happen in your life tell me through guidance yeah. oh. absolutely through guidance and um, so I guess let, let me begin by saying that I did not come on to this path with an understanding of universal energy. I came onto the path of uh, really wanting to heal myself. That's what kind of catapulted me into this work. And uh, prior to meeting Barbara, I, I mean, it's funny because I look back at photographs of me in, I, I lived in, in Europe and in the Middle East and in high school, I, I saw these photographs of me like putting my hands around someone. And seriously, I had zero idea uh, about what I was doing, but I guess there was something in me that, that had an intrinsic understanding, an intrinsic awareness, even though consciously I, uh, that wasn't present. Uh, but what really started me was you know, have, and I write about this, you know, in my book, having come through uh, a very serious illness in my 20s, um, feeling like I was about 80 years old when I was 27. I, I was like, why am I here? You know, and there has to be more. And, and I was very uh, ignorant about uh, energy work and healing during the course of my illness. Had I had that as, as a support, it may have been a very different outcome for me in terms of my physical healing. But in terms of my soul healing, emotional, spiritual, mental, I mean, it just, well, it's been profound. So, um, uh, so when I met Barbara, which was really not even of my calling. Uh, a friend of mine suggested that we go meet these two healers, uh, Pat Rodegast and Barbara Brennan. And so I walked in the room and this, this I think has really been a big part when I talk about guidance. Uh, I have been uh, graced uh, and privileged with the ability to hear see and feel subtle energies. Oh. So as soon as we walked into that room with Barbara, I heard a voice that said, you're home. And, and I was like, wow, home. And I have to tell you, I mean, I have an interesting path with the school because I hugely resisted the your home. And, um, for the first three years, and, and my students know this, I've shared this story with them, but my first three years, I was always the last person to sign up for the following year. I, I called it the journey, the confessions of a reluctant healer. You were a and, very bad student. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I was, it, it's interesting. What I learned through that whole process is is deeply about divine will and divine precision because i left after my third year for two years and i was also studying with other other healers in the world wonderful healers and but everything felt like it just started to 
like it felt like doors were closing is the best way I can describe it. And one evening after two years of being away from the school, I was walking through the woods one evening and I just said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And a word, the voice said, school. Now that voice is not a voice inside of my head. That voice has come probably about 10 times to me in my life. It is a voice outside. It's in the physical world and it's spirit. And I said, okay, you win. I'll go back. And I called Barbara and she was like, well, you've gone, been gone for two years. When, when I left the school, there were about 15 students in the school. Mm. Okay. And then hands of light had exploded. So when I came back, there were about 50 students in the school. So she said, look, I have to test you. You have to meet me in this hotel. I'm going to be in Washington, D.C., bring a client, all that sort of thing. So when I was doing the healing and she was observing me, I realized that during those two years, my high sense, what we call high sense perception, the ability to perceive beyond the normal senses had exploded exponentially. And the other interesting thing that happened was as soon as I said, yes, I will go back, Barbara called me after she accepted me back in. She called me about two weeks later. She said, look, I really want you in the teacher training program, which back in those days happened while you were in your last year. I said, yes. I so graduated. You, you, suddenly you became a good student. Suddenly. Yes. And this, this, I say, is guidance for everyone. It's okay to be a bad student in your life because it really is about, I, I call it risk, passion, purpose, pursuit. Whether we, those of us who, who are really committed to the path and the evolution of consciousness, it, it requires taking risks. It requires stepping out of kind of the ordinary trajectory of life and exploring. So I stepped away from the normal four years. But when I came back, within a year, my life was completely changed. I had moved to New York to be with Bar to work with Barbara. She had invited me to work with her. So do you understand it was all imprecise timing? Yes, yes, I understand. But let me ask you a question because uh, it triggers me when you're telling this. Uh -huh. um, do you believe that all of us can have these kind of voices or at least messages or something that is telling us something to do something. There is three something in the sentences. I'm very grammatically very bad, but you understand what I mean? I understand. Do, 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 do we have this? Do you believe in this? Absolutely. I absolutely believe and I have countless experiences, not only my own, but from uh, people I know, and also from the thousands of students I've had the privilege to work with. I have absolutely come to know that we are never alone, and, uh, and that we are being guided, and we are being cared for, and we do have free will. We can be bad. We can be bad students. <laughs> we can be bad. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I could tell you stories within my own life where I have received guidance and not followed it with free will. And I've had the resulting experience. I can uh, tell you of stories where I have followed divine will and have had uh, the, the resulting experience out of that. Here's the other thing, because I kind of want to get off the bad good thing, because uh, it's actually not the, the, the sense of my work, uh, because it's easy for people to fall into a place, and I know we're joking about the terms, but, but humanity, you know, kind of beneath the defenses and everything, kind of hold a universal belief that there is something wrong with us. I mean, a lot of religious doctrines teach about original sin. Um, I personally don't don't uh, don't ascribe to that uh, to that way of thought, because what I see, and I, I actually call it the living practice, is look, we are here 
to remember and to reclaim parts of ourselves that we have forgotten, what I call the truth of who we are. And no matter what choices we make, even though they have consequences from my experience, uh, whatever you want to call it, source, the divine God, uh, whatever you want to call it, never is judging or punishing us because of those choices. Yeah. Um, each choice just leads to a new, another experience and another opportunity. And a you know? new learning. And a new learning. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I used to hold a belief that there was something wrong with me. And, uh, and, that, and that, you know, if we, if we talk about healing from the broader perspective, to me, that's really um, the point of healing is to heal these belief systems within ourselves, these misunderstandings. Yeah. You know, and I have to say, I've, I've thought about like, what if I had gone through the school in the, in the normal four years? By the way, I've never done anything normal in that way. You can ask my family in terms of whatever I've studied. I've definitely set my own course. Um, but I don't know if I had done it in the four years, if I would have ended up in East Hampton working with Barbara. Mm -hmm. Whatever needed to happen in terms of my own spiritual maturation over those two years uh, prepared me because it's interesting. I mean, I had a background in business and also as a pastry chef um, when I met Barbara. And very early on, she was like, I need, I need, I need management. I need help. This is when she was pretty much teaching by herself. This was in 1986. And I said, oh, well, I, I have a background in, in business and, you know, I could certainly help you. And she took one look at me and she was like, no way. You, you wouldn't last six months. And she lived in New York City at the time. You wouldn't last six months in New York City. Um, so she recognized something in me and I recognized something in me that there was no way I was ready. But, but six years later, the, or actually, I guess it was seven years after I completed my last year, I had arrived at a place within myself. I mean, she and I, yeah, I've spent my life working, working with Barbara. So I guess I want to say that, that maybe spirit also had me leave for two years. Yeah. I don't know if that yeah. makes sense. Yes, it does. Absolutely. I, I believe that. Yes. In fact, uh, well, there is a concept that you mentioned that also triggers me, the truth about uh, what you are. We used to talk about who are. of who you are, sorry. Uh, there is another concept that we call the butterfly effect, uh, the, you know, the, the metaphor of the chaos theory, etc. And Barbara has another theoretical background framework about that. And she described in her uh, theoretical background, this phenomenon as the holographic concept. Is it the same thing? Are we talking about the same thing here? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Francois, because I received your, um, you know, your email to me, and I thought a lot about this. Since receiving your email, I don't think that they are contradictory theories. Mm. Um, I think they're complementary. What I know of consciousness at this stage of my journey is that everything affects everything. That's the butterfly effect, right? Yeah. Um, and I think Carl Jung wrote something, I'm paraphrasing, but basically, you know, uh, just as we are affected by the unconscious, so we also affect the unconscious. Mm as we become more conscious. So that, so you have that, everything affects everything. And then you have the holographic uh, theory, which is all, all parts contain the whole. Yes. Right? And it's like that, the very famous apple experiment, 
that no matter how many times they cut the apple, the whole image of the apple appeared. However, what was interesting too about that one, and by the way, I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm an experiencer. I, 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 I teach from what I have personally experienced. Um, but what they discovered, what they saw is each, with each slice of the apple, the image became more diffuse, less clear, right? So if they split it in half and they had two apples, they were pretty clear. But a thousand slices down the road, it was, it was less. So with that, it also says to me that, um, uh, that as we bring these different parts together, and this is part of my interest in the evolution of consciousness, that we have a clearer picture of the whole. But let me give you an example of the holographic from my own experience. Yeah. Um, we were doing this um, experiment with Barbara in teacher training, which was for me in 1992, 1991, 1992. And we were asked to put our hand on our client's body and it was just fellow teachers. And I put my hand on a friend of mine. She was a teacher. I just gotten to know her. She lived in Canada and I put my hand and I, I saw this whole movie about her. And I knew her very little at the time. And afterward I said, um, I said, wow, here's what I saw. I saw you running through the park in Ottawa, Canada, mm. and it was fall and it was cold and the leaves were on the ground and, and I could smell them. They were a little moldy and you were running with a woman. Okay. Along this running trail. And she said, wow. She said, Lori, I last fall decided I was going to train for the Ottawa marathon. And she said, and I was looking for a running partner. So I put an ad in the newspaper and this woman answered. So we became running partners. So there I had a picture. I saw from a part of her just in her body, I got this whole picture about her life. Yeah. So, um, so for me, going back to your question, to me, they aren't contradictory theories. They're complementary complimentary are you yes. are you using well it's a it's a packed question here but how i would <laughs> say how are you using this when you how are you using this information you get from clients when you're you uh, higher sense of perception yeah so um i i guess that it's rich it's rich information for yourself isn't it it is. So I begin every session in silence with my clients. And m most of my work is long distance mm -hmm. all over the world. Okay. I begin my sessions in silence. And oftentimes in that silence, I am, I am given information. Uh, it might be, it might be something very small. It might be an image of something. Okay, or I might feel something or I might get like what we call through the seven chakra kind of a direct knowing. Yeah. And when I get that, I just set it aside. Okay, and I proceed with the session. And then very often, whatever that was that I perceived kind of comes to the foreground, that it's kind of an, a, a, a piece of the puzzle for that session. And, and let me say something else about this, because what I call in my work, and this is what I teach my students and also practitioners, I call my work essentially, I mean, following the soul. What I see as uh, the soul is always revealing itself every moment. The world is always revealing itself every moment. You know, as Yeats wrote, it's like the world is full of magic, just awaiting for our senses to become sharper. Well, that's part of what happens when we expand our consciousness and when we open to these innate abilities that I believe we all have to perceive beyond the third dimension. Okay. So um, uh, when we can pay attention to that, if I ask someone, oh, how are you doing today? 
oh, I'm doing fine. And their field is going, I am not fine. I am really upset about something, but I'm going to pretend that I'm fine. I always say the field does not lie. Yeah. Okay. It's always revealing. So if I can pay attention to that and begin to gently uh, presence that with my client, very often they arrive in a place of recognition that they've been longing for, that has come through the field, the hara, the core star, the physical body, and dimensions beyond that. And, and I've often said to my students, look, I said, as humans, I think that almost more than anything, that we're afraid we deeply long to reveal ourselves mm -hmm. and to be accepted and known and loved by the other. And in return, we deeply long for the other to reveal themselves yes. so that we can know them deeply. So high sense perception really helps with that. Yes, you can recognize yourself, then reconnect yourself to what you really are, then disease disappear or slowly reduce, because that's also the concept. Disconnection versus connection make disease appear. Can you explain that? Because it's also a concept behind the Barbara's uh, science also. How can we, how, how by being disconnected disease appear? And the opposite, when we reconnect, how health come back? Okay, so let me tell you, my definition of dis-ease is not purely connected to the physical. I mean, we are biological organisms. I'm gonna die, you're gonna die. The tree outside my window is gonna die. Okay, so sometimes people um, get caught up in this belief that, uh, gee, if I'm fully connected and everything, I'm not going to get ill and I'm not going to die. Well, that's an impossibility. Or if I'm good, I'm not going to get sick and I'm not going to die. I have worked with many people who, um, who have healed emotionally, um, but physically they have not. I have worked with many people who have healed physically and emotionally, and I also want to include mental, spiritual. So for me, healing is, is intrinsically coming home to the self. And by the self, I don't just mean the personality. I mean the broader understanding, that larger context of the self. Um, I see that we are actually all that is. Having, having had experiences of being completely awakened, you know, or what people might call enlightened, uh, you have a very different view and understanding of yep. it all. But to get back to your question around disconnection and dis-ease and health, um, I think another way we could say this is when we are responsive, when we say yes, yes to whatever is within us and uh, yes to, to all life experiences, then we experience health. Mm -hmm. When we start to block and say no, when we choose to live only on the surface of, of life, which is fairly disconnected, uh, then we have disease, and disease might just be uh, uh, an uncomfortability with one's life. Um, in other words, it may not be physical. It may be someone who's distraught emotionally or who's always in reaction. It's like, I mean, there's so many different ways that disease, disease can manifest. Do you believe that this whole process has to be chosen by the person? I mean, someone can know that and not choose to do that, or can choose because at least at the end of the day, this is the the the, the freedom of the 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 person to to decide to to go there, right? So this this awakening is not something that you impose 
This is something that the person choose, isn't it? Yes, yes. Or spirit in its infinite wisdom um, may prompt one strongly. I mean, I'm sure that was part of my illness in my 20s was to really help me to get onto this path. It was painful, but yes. Yes, I think we have the choice. Absolutely. And, and then we, when we become aware, the process of healing starts. Because, I mean, healing, in a way, as far as I know, is made by the, the person that I am healing. It's not made really by me, the healer. It is made, the real healing is done by the, 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 the patient, isn't it? Yes, yes, and, and, and spirit with patient, with the patient. And the, so, so if, if we were to look at this kind of at different levels of consciousness around healing, have I had people come to me with a physical condition where they don't believe in any of this and they just want that physical condition healed? Have I had a success? Yes, at times I have. Mm -hmm. And they've gone on and the physical condition is healed but that doesn't connect to to the deeper longings of the soul we've all come to heal yes i think yes. um yes. and those who choose not to i i call them in my book I, I i kind of break the path down into two sequences of forgetting and remembering mm. so we've all forgotten to a degree the path of awakening is the path of remembering mm. Those who are in forgetting, I call kind of the first phase of consciousness, I say they're sleepwalkers. They completely believe their story. They pretty much live on the surface of life and everything that is happening is happening to them. In other words, they're not partners of their own creation, even though they're helping to create it. Right. So right. When, when people start to kind of come out of that, whoa, I'm starting to wake up a little and they move through denial, you know, then it's like, and then they start to move into remembering, then that's, that's a significant game changer in one's life and in their understanding of healing. Right, 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 right. <clears throat> there is another fundamental question that comes to my mind because this is a concept that is also, I think, dear to you, the concept of consciousness. And I'm asking this question because, I mean, 15, maybe 20 years ago or something, I was not so sure. I just was finding this concept so abstract I could not put, uh, you know, that's a cup, right? But show me consciousness because I don't understand. Show me, what is that? So where is it? How does it, <laughs> how does it manifest? Why? Why does it exist and who? Well, I was mesmerized by that concept and yet, feeling somehow that it existed so please laurie what is <laughs> what is consciousness francois you and i could spend the rest of our life uh talking about what is consciousness yes. um you know because it's it it, it it's interesting i mean I, I i appreciated that question when you wrote it to me in the email um because it, it, it took me a little more deeply in like yeah i've kind of been tossing that word around like ah consciousness consciousness <laughs> yes but and uh again i went inside because this second book i'm writing the multi-dimensional self a new paradigm of consciousness for humanity yeah um yeah. uh what i what i understand consciousness to be is awareness and Barbara would say, and I remember this from her very early teachings, she said, look, everybody comes in with, she called it the cone of perception, but in here is your consciousness. In other words, your awareness of both your internal life and external life, okay? And everything you know, like for you, the coffee cup, okay, fits within this. And then 
you have an experience that does not fit within this cone of awareness. And this has to open to accommodate this new experience. Yeah. And then yeah. you have another one and it doesn't fit. And so this has to open more and more and more and more until um, my understanding as of today is until we completely return to the remembering uh, that we are all that is. Look, in 1985, I was going through another tough time. And this is the other thing I've learned about the path. People go, oh, you know, I'm on the path. Yay, it's, you know, it's always up. It isn't always up. Yeah. You get it. <laughs> yeah. So I had come through that very difficult time in my 20s and I, I was meditating and I was really having experiences that my, my this was happening with me a lot. I, I was just growing exponentially in terms of my awareness of all of life and my experiences. So then I, I went through a very, another very difficult time, but also I was guided into that difficult time um, uh, through guidance. Yeah. And, right. and it was that voice again, but it, it's interesting. It took me down and then it brought me out. But during that time, at that very low point, when I was in, I, I would say, kind of the worst despair of my life, um, Grace, Grace woke me up in a moment. And I mean, everything changed. Because I was, com it's, it's what the Buddha writes about. It's what Ramana Maharshi writes about. It's, there was absolutely no ego. There was no attachment to an identity or my body. I was aware I was in a body, but I could also, I remember I could look out and I could see for hundreds of thousands of miles. And everywhere I looked, I saw light. I saw light. I saw light where typically in my human state, I might call it darkness or forgetting. I remember seeing this couple argue and I looked at them and I was like, oh my gosh, they're, they're trying to express love for each other and they're confused. So um, it was absolute freedom and bliss and awe and wonder. There was nothing beyond the arising moment. And that arising moment was absolutely uh, miraculous. And, um, and then a week later, I kind of plopped back down into my identity and into the third dimension. I remember sitting, I was sitting in my house and I kind of, and I had a slight, slight feeling of fear. I felt like slightly separate. When I was awakened, I knew I wasn't separate. I was all that is. As Alan Watts wrote, and I don't know if you're familiar with him, yeah. um, but he was a 20th century yeah, philosopher. He wrote, we are the aperture through which the universe is perceiving itself. Mm -hmm. That was my experience. And that has been my experience when I wake up. So to me, that's like one of the broadest uh, uh, understandings of consciousness. But I don't always live with that. Okay, however, in terms of the evolution of consciousness and the butterfly effect, mm -hmm. I, one of the things that I see is this, this cusp that we are on as humans is as a species, we're very reactive. And our reactions create separation within ourselves, within our families, within our neighbors, within our you know, countries. And I see we are one human family and we are one global consciousness. So when I take the time and I do, I live, I say you can live a life in a day. When I take the time to pause, if I find myself in reaction and I come back into a responsive state, that is affecting just like the butterfly mm -hmm. that is affecting, that is feeding 
the evolution of consciousness. So to me, this is really the thrust of my work at this time. Um, well, it probably always has been, frankly, in my work with people. It's like, how do we become responsive? How do we open ourselves and say yes to whatever is here, moment by moment? Mm. So that's my current understanding of consciousness. And here's the other thing, and I always teach this to my students. I go, look, energy and consciousness cannot be separated. So in other words, when I look at something, whether it's the movement of energy through the field, that also has consciousness. It's one of the things I love about Barbara's model about the chakras and the levels. Somebody can, doesn't just come and lie down on the table, hey, open up all my chakras and let me go about my life. Wait, your chakras are consciousness. If they're closed, you've closed them for a reason, you know? So mm -hmm. let's connect into that. That's certainly been my own journey. The same thing with the levels. But that's true for everything. Right. So right. In, in just one last thing I wanna say about consciousness, I, I, I deeply experience that we are all co-creating our lives and thus we are all co-creating the consciousness of humanity. We're doing it, for the most part, unconsciously. How do we become conscious co-creators of our life and the world that we say we want to create together? So that's really kind of the thrust, I would say, of my work. Yes, interesting and inspiring. I have two questions. I'll try to make order because right now you're talking about common collective unconsciousness. Let's remember that question because right now I have another one which is your when you went down and came back up do you believe well another packed question <laughs> when we are going down is it something that is automatically a transformative process and how can we understand that when we are going down because i suspect that yourself when you were down you would not be necessarily very happy about that right so yeah. uh how can we because i'm trying to to inspire the one that are now going down because of what's going on and uh assure them that this path is transformative and there is an other part of the uh, of the of the way is it mm -hmm. yeah so in my book i write it i call it the phase of sos <laughs> um <laughs> yeah because uh everything is fracturing uh, and by the way that is uh the first phase of remembering mm. in, in the sequence of remembering okay because to me that it's such a powerful, potent phase, but one typically does not have the, the access to the inner resources. Uh, it needs a lot of support from the outside. It needs, it needs unconditional loving and reflection and belief in them that they can, that they can, that, that they will emerge out of this um, uh, more whole than they are in the moment. It's, it's a challenging phase. I mean, having lived through it a couple of times in my life, what I do see that happens over time is, um, and I talk about this, this is one of the last phases, I call it the committed phase. And in that phase, one's gained uh, what I call spiritual maturation. So early on in the path, we're like kind of crazy, you know? It's like, we, we can't, it's like, SOS. SOS. SOS, yeah. <laughs> um, but over time, as we spiritually mature, our ability to be with what is, our ability to be in the unknown un with uncertainty, our ability to be with emerging consciousness is, is, uh, is a greater constant. Mm -hmm. So even though we may experience uh 
you know, disease, illness, trauma, death, tra you know, all of it, and where well, there's a lot of it in the world, uh, our ability to be with it has increased because also our container, okay, our state of consciousness has increased so that we can hold more. Right, right, right. Oh, very interesting and enlightening. And now it leads me to this other question that I put on hold is the collective consciousness. Well, that's a common concept that we have, but what, what, well, what, with what you just said, it seems that we are feeding this uh, collective common consciousness, is it? And how can we describe that? How can we, how does it happen? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's, it's a really great question. Um, it's, well, we're always feeding it. Okay, we're always feeding it. Um, again, it com I come back to how do we feed it consciously? Mm. And look, we live from, from my experiences, we live in a benign universe, you know, that cares deeply for us. Um, you know, it's the, the Bodhisattva. It's like this, uh, this compassion for us. Um, see, I think most people do not understand the intrinsic power that they possess in terms of becoming an enlightened conscious co-creator. When, when I grow, the collective unconsciousness grows. When you grow, the collective unconsciousness grows. So it's kind of like the hundredth monkey theory, right? I know the students coming in now are very different than the students when I started. People are coming in with more awareness of things that were pretty unknown back in 80 or were very, very new. I mean, look, look at the evolution of the term around uh, healing. It was originally, it was called um, alternative. Yeah. Then it became complementary. Yeah. And then Harvard about 15 years ago, the University of Harvard said, wait a minute, we're going to change this to integrative healthcare. Right. So the work you and I are engaged in, 30 years ago was seen as fringe. Um, now, I mean, some people might still see it that way, but more and more there is, if not an understanding, a regard On uh, that there's more here than meets the eye. That is completely true. And that is why this university that we have in Sri Lanka exists, right? Because uh, at least there is an institution in the world that is uh, uh, d deepening this, this concept of integration between the two uh, approaches, because none of them is bad, right? There is No, my God. I would not be alive today if it were not for uh, allopathic medicine. It saved my life, yeah. you know? Yeah. And again, for me, healing is, I mean, healing is, Look, I believe everybody's actually a healer. I believe healing is a state of being. It's a state of consciousness. When I'm walking down the street, if I'm being dismissive of someone, that is not a healing or healer's experience. If I'm walking down the street and I am aware and inclusive and cognizant of others, that can be a healing experience. So um, I think this, this becoming more conscious in our creations is we are called to embrace each other as brothers and sisters, as one human family, no yeah. matter where we come from, no matter what our, you know, I mean, it just, and I've always felt this. I mean, my mother said, she used to say I was from a different star, you know, when I was five years old. And she was right. <laughs> Definitely from a different star. I could tell you that. And but you she were would a bad student. Also, yeah, also. I'm, a, I'm a bad student, but I'm a great universal citizen. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
um, yeah, but she did. I, I was always like, I, I, my heart would break whenever I saw anything or anyone in distress. They, they said I would go up to strangers, you know, like uh, people sitting on park benches and take their hand and go, you know, you lost, you know, do you want me to stay with you? Um, I told her when I was five, this is when she said, you're from a different star. I said, when I grow up, I'm going to adopt children from all over the world. And it turned out my path was the illness in my twenties is I was totally unable then to have children. Oh, and, yeah. and, and spirit put me on this path that is, is the right path for me in this life. And I remember looking out at when we had our school in Austria and I was looking out at all the students that were coming from like 30 some countries. And I was like, Oh my God, this is what I was saying at five. There you go. So what's really cool about that is when we get messages Okay, and when we have these understandings, they may not always play out as our personality would think, but from the bigger picture of spirit, they're always perfect. Right. You know? And we have to listen to them, right? We yeah. have to listen to them. But at least we have to know that this exists, right? Because we receive constantly messages uh, and uh, if we are not listening to them or we don't know that these are, these are messages, we believe, don't we? We believe that it is just our imagination or, or something else. We don't recognize. Yeah, well, that's why, yeah, when we teach about high sense perception, and I often refer to it, it with, in my own work now, I call it expanded perception. Um, because to me, it's kind of a 360 degree piece, but we, we talk about it. And when we teach about it, we say, look, it takes practice and confirmation because at first, so the, here's, here's an example of this. Uh, and, and this is my first weekend with Barbara. So I come in, I, I hear I'm home. Okay. The, most of the rest of the weekend, I am frustrated and bored. Um, because we're doing exercises to experience the field and everybody seems to be perceiving something and I have zero. And I'm kind of going, I think they're making this up. Uh, you know, it's just, it, but the last healing on the last day, I had my hands on this guy, his name was David. And I was giving him a healing and this, this, this x-ray showed up and literally it was like in the third dimension and it was of his spine and it was crooked. I mean, I could have reached out and touched it. And I looked at it and I went, wow, what's that? And then it dissolved. And afterward I said, David, I said, this is gonna sound crazy. I said, but I saw an x-ray of your spine and it's crooked. And he said, Lori, look, I want to show you something. And he lifted up his shirt in the back. He said, I have major scoliosis. Mm. I've had many surgeries. So I was confirmed because I'm thinking like I'm making this up. Right. And he confirmed me. What I tell my students is I said, that was called what I call a spiritual carrot. Okay. Just like horses will follow carrots. Well, spirit gives us things like that to follow. I didn't see anything else for another six months because I had a lot of work to do to open my own energy system. And my site actually was not, um, was not stable until my third year. And when it opened, I was like, we were reading this, this a fellow student, all of us together. There were about 11 of us in the room his name was John. And all of a sudden my site opened. I was like, Oh, okay. Like in a stable way. And it, it hasn't closed since then. So, um, and since that moment you became kind of aware that you are a psychic medium also. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely being able to perceive and, and I, and, even back in those days, Barbara was teaching channeling early on. I'm like, no way, I'm not channeling. I'm not even in my body. I don't want anything else coming in my body, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's interesting about that because we were sitting in Boston 
big workshop. I think we had about 500 people. Barbara was on the stage. She would channel what she calls the goddess healing energy. And I was a neophyte back in those days. So I sat off stage beside her. And I'm sitting there as we're just tuning in for the work. And I hear the words, allow the sweetness. And then Barbara opens her mouth and the first words out of her mouth were, allow the sweetness. Oh my God. And then I saw myself giving this, this, this high energy of this goddess energy to the audience. I, I just saw it. I wasn't doing it. And then afterward, uh, we went to her room and she turned to me and she said, Lori, you're supposed to begin channeling the goddess. And I said, yeah, I know. Because I had had the initiation from spirit before she told me. So again, it took it out of the realm of, am I making this up? Yeah. Okay, to, oh, this is, and now I channel, I channel all the time. It's a very natural part of who I am and my work. And that's your empiric personality also. You have to feel, you have to, well, you teach and what you experience, isn't it? You, you cannot yes. teach something that is written in a book. Well, unless you have to feel it and seen it, but exactly you're like me basically <laughs> you know what this is interesting and and actually i was thinking about this early on because it might be a, an institution you want to connect in with at the university of virginia they have uh, what's called the division of perceptual studies oh okay and they have been studying altered states of consciousness for 50 years oh and they have these amazing amazing scientists engineers, mathematicians, and, and I went there, I was doing some research there about healing, and they, they had a moo, a moo room, you know, it's like the room that's about this thick, so no outside frequencies can come in, and while I was there, they said, hey, well, what do you, what do you want to do? We'll do any, any experiment you want to do. I said, I really want you to measure my brain waves. Oh. I said, because I know that when I channel my whole, and I'm saying this because to me, this is also something I teach and I'm interested in humans learning because we can shift our state of, of consciousness by shifting our brain waves. We can shift our emotional state. So they said, you can shift it at, at will. I said, yeah, yeah, I can. And they said, okay, well, so they hooked up an EEG yeah. They put me in the room and they, they, we spent an hour and they said, we're going to ask you, this is, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to do 12 rounds. We're going to ask you to channel. Okay. Connect into guide your guide spirit and channel for four minutes. Then we're going to ask you to go to rest for two minutes. Then we're going to ask you to do four, then two, four, two. Okay. So that's what we did for an hour. And at the end, and, and they said, you know, we'd like you to come back and do some more. At the end, they were like, wow. They said, like, kind of as a preliminary piece of research, they said, Lori, your whole brain lit up at one time in the Schumann resonance wave, which is the alpha theta brain wave. Yeah. They said, yeah. that's very unusual. They said, typically what we'll see for long-term meditators is one part of the brain will light up then another part of the brain will light up. They said, but your whole brain lit up, okay? Now, uh, roll forward to, I'm in Boston, they're, they're doing a fundraiser and, and the different scientists and mathematicians are, are presenting. They, they study um, past life with children, uh, near-death experiences, levitation, long-term meditation, etc. Well, the one, this other guy gets up to speak, and he actually wrote the foreword to my book, Jeffrey Olson, and he had had a, a near, a very tragic uh, experience and near-death experience. Yeah. And he stood up and he said, "I'm an experiencer," and I was like, "Oh my God, this is the first time I've heard this." I said, "Because in this world," that I teach in, I don't have a mathematical background. I don't have a scientific background. 
And I was like, oh, there is a place for experiencers. Yeah. In this work. Hmm. So that's when I that's when I kind of got that term from him. Yes. You if you if you navigate through our channel, you will find the, the creator of this work, Raymond Moody. Dr. Raymond Moody. Oh Dr. yeah. Raymond. He, yeah, I know Raymond he, Moody. Yes. I mean I've met him, I've met him at uh at um some of the whole life expos when Barbara used to lecture. Yeah, yeah. So he's uh, one of our, our of uh, our guests as well. So okay, so, great. He's an amazing speaker, and uh, also, speak. yes, and he has a objective. I would say not so much objective after the amount of uh, interview that he's done, but quite an interesting point of view about uh, about that, right? Okay, so now uh, I'd like to hear about your multidimensional self. You're going to publish this book. What is it about? Consciousness? <laughs> yes, yes, it's about consciousness. Um, so I, I mentioned the following the soul work, right? Well, I also have another piece. It's called The Living Practice. And... Um, I've kind of broken it down. I'm, I'm, Barbara and I are similar in this way. She, she had this real, um, I mean, this great ability to take kind of abstract esoteric concepts and make them applicable mm -hmm. and understandable. I, I kind of think the same way. And I, I think it's one of the reasons why we, I mean, aside from many others, but one of the reasons why we, um, why I, I worked you know, was so privileged to work with her and, and why we worked so well together, because I think we think similarly. I like breaking things down so that, um, so that they are applicable and, and that they are accessible. When I, when I wrote Awakening to the Truth of Who You Are, I wrote it with the idea that I wanted it to be anybody could pick it up you know, and find something for themselves. It wasn't kind of this big, you know, abstract out there. So the living practice, what I have come to understand is five points. If we want to, if we want to evolve, and I'm going to write more extensively about this in the multidimensional self, we're always creating. So there's create, and then there's experience. We're always experiencing our creations that we may not be fully aware that we are. So how do we become more fully aware? We pause. It's my favorite word. Pause, pause, pause. What do you pause. mean? What do you mean? Pause means to take a breath, to slow down. You know, I go, look, if you want to change your life, pause. Because that gives you the opportunity to go inside and um, see. And to reflect upon what's going on. So after pause comes inquiry, self-inquiry. And Ramana Maharshi, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, uh, but he wrote about that as the path of awakening. You know, like by questioning ourselves. That's what Eckhart Tolle did. That's what Byron Katie did. Why? Who is the I that's experiencing this, right? When we go through these steps, okay, within ourselves, what I have come to understand is transformation is a naturally occurring result. In other words, transformation isn't something we do. Transformation is something that occurs yeah. out of yeah. these other practices. So with the multidimensional self and having had so many experiences in my life, starting at the age of eight, of, of really kind of extraordinary experiences that go way beyond this dimension. Um, uh, what I see, and this is what to me is so important about the, the human energy field is the human energy field is like the, uh, it's like the intersection between our personality and the soul. Right. It's one of the great ways where the soul can communicate and we can perceive it. All right. Mm -hmm. So as multidimensional beings, and I think physics says now there's at least, we live in at least 
10 different dimensions. If not more. <laughs> if not more, exactly, if not more. So I often see the fifth dimension as this place that's kind of a mirroring, but from a higher frequency. So as we open to more and more expanding our consciousness, to me, and, and that means, and this is what I also write about in the second book, is moving from reaction to response. I mean, we can change the world. We can change our consciousness as one human family as we open and embrace that we are more than what meets the eye. Yeah, right. Wow. <laughs> this is very, very inspiring. I have a question. Maybe my last one, but not the least. Uh, you said that the children, that the kids, the new students that comes to the school are different. What about the today's children? Because they are also the result of uh, collective unconsciousness. So how, how do you see them? How do you, what is your vision of that? Yeah, you know? well, let, let me, okay. So the students who come into the school are adults. They're not kids. You have to be at least 18 years of age. But I guess I was speaking metaphorically when I looked out from the stage in, in Austria. Okay, yes, so, so that's one thing, because um, I really want to honor their adult selves <laughs> yes, <laughs> that have brought them to the school. Um, but they're coming in with uh, definitely a greater awareness. You know, I don't, what your question is an important one. And um, uh, I, have, I have young kids in my life, um, and I'm amazed by them. Uh, it, it's interesting because also, and I have many teachers in my life, teachers in, in, uh, in the traditional school system. And I think the kids today are really facing unprecedented challenges. Um, you know, I was born in the 50s and, you know, you know it was kind of, you Me. too? <laughs> What year? <laughs> 57. Oh, I'm 53. <laughs> oh, younger than. <laughs> <laughs> You're younger than me. <laughs> um, we didn't think about things like climate change, uh, recycling, uh, uh, toxins. I mean, we, we didn't think about it. It was kind of a time on, uh, for many parts of the planet, of course, many parts of the planet have been in, in uh, uh, you know, have been hugely disadvantaged. You know, I, I grew up in the States and we kind of had this plethora, right, of excess, frankly. Um, I never even heard the word drug until I was 15 years old in terms of recreational drugs. I remember going to one of my niece's kindergarten classes. This is, she's in her thirties now. And I was going to teach them how to make chocolate mousse uh, in kindergarten. And they had a big poster above the sink around uh, recreational drugs, you know, and just say no. And I'm like going, Oh my God, this, I didn't have to grow up with that. So, <sighs> The children today are impacted with uh, much younger than things I had to ever think about. And um, uh, I mean, look, they're wearing masks. Yeah. You know, yeah. and 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 we're dealing with huge, a uh, huge climate crisis. Huge. And and we're also though we always were, we're much more aware that we are a global economy. Uh, and so there's so much. Um, well, Laura, Laurie, sorry. Uh, do you believe that all of these challenges are having 
and uh, I would say a hopeful outcome thanks to the development of their well they have access to new technologies they have access to new ideas etc so does it make them more aware in a in a way do you believe uh yeah in a way yes and in a way no because people are and kids and this is one of the things um uh i've heard from people in my life who teach kids that uh their attention span is shorter Mm -hmm. um uh everybody's kind of addicted to the screen and i saw all this cartoon it was of a teacher who had made this big screen around her and she said now i finally got your attention she's in the classroom <laughs> yeah. uh, but there's something to be said about that and and there's this there's so much information that it's it's almost too much to process you know i think about kind of the 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 mythological aspect of atlantis where they said look why did it fall well it fell because uh the technological abilities out uh outgrew uh what the the humanity the heart could hold could could cope with you know what i mean yeah could cope with so i do have great hope I mean, I, I'm, I'm very much an optimist. I'm with Greg Braden. You know, it's like, look, we are the co-creators. We are all that is. We have the power within us to create the world that we want. Are we willing to join together, heart to heart, as well as technology? I mean, you know, it's interesting about... You know, we, I think about the climate crisis. Look, when, when the coronavirus hit, it was like, oh, all of a sudden, like car companies could switch and make ventilators, you know? When um, I know in World War II, my dad was saying, uh, he, my dad's this big history buff and he had these statistics. He was sharing with me like the goals in the United States to make so many whatever ships. We, we out, we made more than was called for in the shorter amount of time. And I'm saying that because in humanity, we are, we are genius. So I do believe that we have the ability to meet these challenges and become very creative and caring in the process. And I see it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I see it. So even with these pieces that are challenging and, uh, and, and discouraging, I have tremendous hope in the kids. I think they're calling it the, uh, the generation of resiliency. Yes. You know? Um, uh, and I was just, I saw something on YouTube yesterday or well, last week, I guess it was um, calling uh, like the great revelation. Mm -hmm. You know, we heard about the great wars, the great depressions, the great revelations. So I think some of the challenges that we're being faced with are opportunities to, uh, to not only meet them in a technological and inventive way, but to do so through, uh, through our vast capacity to, to love each other and ourselves. As Rumi wrote, he said, look, the object isn't to love, you know, the, the objective is not to love. The objective is simply to remove the obstacles that stand in the way of the love that you are. I'm paraphrasing him. In other words, I really, I truly see, and, and I call it, um, when I talk about awakening to the truth of who you are, uh, perceived as light expressed as love it's an action it's a verb and experienced as joy and peace um those have been my experiences in awakening and that's what i see in the world as as this younger generation is i mean it's it's amazing what i'm seeing in the in the younger people really right the right. degree of social action and engagement and the wanting to move beyond uh, limitations and prejudices and uh, and the idea of that we are one family and the giving back and 
so yeah i have, I have a lot of hope yes well that's a hopeful message that you are delivering us and i think we're gonna conclude with this hope yeah. because if not we're gonna be pressed <laughs> it's, it's a great it's a great way to end for sure yes yes but i love it because i can completely agree that uh, they are holding uh, the solutions in their hands right isn't it they are and in their hearts yes yes mostly and mostly. it's not just they it's we I mean, we're still here. You and I, we're still on the planet. Oh, so. <laughs> yes, completely. Yes. Well, Laurie, I, I am completely amazed. That was such a pleasure uh, and uh, very, very, very insightful. And I don't know how to thank you. And uh, I believe that our audience will... Uh, be amazed with uh, your insights. So uh, thank you for being with us. And thank you, Francois. It has been absolutely wonderful to sit here and spend this last hour and a half yeah. in conversation. Thank you. And I wish you well on your journey you. and, and everything that you're bringing in to thank the world. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. As we say in Sri Lanka, Aiboan. Aiboan? Aiboan, it means namaste. Ah, Aiboan. Yeah. Namaste. Ha, so good night and uh, hope to meet you soon. Okay? Yes, I would look forward to that. Take care, Francois. Okay, take care. Goodbye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.